My name is Sarah Smith. I'm a professor of history at American River College. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and today's date is June 20th, 2023. So let's start off by establishing the basics. Uh, what's your full name? What are your pronouns? And what's your date of birth? All right. My name is Meiko Elias Chavez. I am 19 years old. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, so tell me a little about yourself. What are your interests and hobbies? What do you like to do? So I'm originally from Connecticut. I moved here a little bit, like two weeks after I graduated high school, but I was born and raised in New York, Sleepy Hollow, New York to be exact. Um, for a few years, then moved to Connecticut, but I've been all over. I lived in Puerto Rico for a year, lived in Peru for a year. I come from immigrant parents. My father is originally from Peru. He immigrated here, I think it's like 20 something years now. Cannot remember. Uh, my mother technically moved here from Puerto Rico, but was born in Manhattan. So I was raised in a, um, I guess, tricultural household between Puerto Rican culture, Peruvian culture, as well as American culture. I also, in that same sense, learned Spanish. Um, my first language is Spanish, despite sounding so well. Um, but I, I'm also fluent in English. Um, I'm the oldest of four siblings. Um, I basically raised all those three kids, so they are technically my children. I love them to death. Um, yeah, that's about it. So what are some of your interests and hobbies? What do you like to do in your free time? That's always hard for me to answer because when I'm not doing, when I'm not at school, I'm working. When I'm not working, I'm at school. But when I have downtime, I like to read. I haven't been able to pick up a lot of books, but I finally finished Memoirs of a Geisha. Uh, in about two months, I put it down. It was pretty good. Um, if I'm not reading, I like playing video games or I like to write. Writing has always been like a coping mechanism for me growing up. Um, I've been really into like writing poetry or writing like creative writing, like writing my own stories, which I was really good at when I was younger. Not so much now. Um, I like dabbling into different forms, like different mediums of art. So like ceramics was really big for me during COVID because I took a ceramics class and I loved it. So it's like a hand, it's more hands on, so it helps me focus more. Um, yeah, digital I've picked up also after COVID. Um, not so, I don't do it so much now, but I stick more with traditional uh, art, so like actually hand drawing because I can see how it comes to life on the page. Um, I also do painting, some sculpting, watercolor, photography. I do all sorts of stuff. Do you do hand thrown ceramics or um, what do you call it? Hand building? Yeah, there's like wheel thrown. Oh, like, wheel thrown. Yeah, you do it on the wheel, or you can do it by hand. I couldn't get to the wheel because I it was like via Zoom, so we had to do it online. But um, I mostly did like the hand stuff, so we learned how to make bowls out of our own hands, and I think I like that better because I could actually like put my ideas into what I wanted to do on the clay instead of like wheel pottery, which I want to try, but it's expensive to get a wheel. Um, so where do you currently attend college, um, and what do you study? I'm currently. Uh, enrolled full-time at American River College. I just finished my first year and I'm going into my second year in the fall and I am a poli-sci major. And what brought you to poli-sci? Oh lord, every time I get asked that I feel like I don't know, like my story keeps changing. Um, this is gonna sound really corny, but <laughs> I grew up watching Law & Order Special Victims Unit because my titi, which is Puerto Rican version of saying like your tia or like your aunt, my titi Shaila, uh, shout out to her by the way <laughs> she really was into it for some reason and so I would watch it with her every day and I got really into it and then I started to like really hone in on how the system like the legal system worked and like the different policies and then I started doing my own research like how does voting work how does you know somebody get caught what's the process of them being sent to prison um, what are the names for the different people involved in these different roles and so it actually got me more interested when I got, when I went into, what was it? I went to high school. I got more interested then. Um, I took a civics class junior year and it was online and I wasn't doing very well mentally. So I wasn't as invested, invested, sorry, as I should have been. But I think I left that class wanting more. And when we went back in person senior year, I enrolled in a Law in America class. I was 
immediately like, yeah, I want to do something like this. And I know pol political science is more about like the systems, um, depending on where you're looking at, like let's say the systems in America and how government works. But I feel like if I wanted to do law, which is what I want to do, I need to know how the systems work internally so I can kind of change that and change whatever systemic issues are in it. So that's kind of what got me interested. It's different little things throughout my, my life. So what kind of law do you think you want to practice? I've been really interested in maybe immigration law. My dad, uh, when I went to visit back in the holidays, um, he kept telling me that I should do immigration law. And he also mentioned it when I graduated in high school, like I told him, um, I want to do law, like I want to be a lawyer, but I don't know what kind of law I want to do. He's like, you should do immigration law. We need more people like us. We need people who understand the immigrant experience, who speak our language and understand, you know, what we can do to help our people. And I got really inspired by that because I, I was little, but I still remember like, you know, the conversations my parents would have about like his citizenship. Cause he didn't get citizenship until my first. So we, I have two brothers. The first one was born. He's 15 now. So he got it right around that one was born. Like his, like it was crazy. It took forever. And he's been here and done his duty as any other American citizen. And, I've also seen it, um, the experience, the immigration experience with my other family members. Um, I have a bunch of family from my dad's side who have immigrated from Peru. One of my aunts actually just recently got her papers, so that's awesome. I couldn't, you know, congratulate her, but she's, you know, at home with my family and she's safe because stay over there is awful. But I saw how it affected my family and the stress and, you know, the financial stress, but also the emotional stress and I'm like, yeah, I think I want to do immigration law. I want to do something that helps my people and gives them the experience that my dad got, my family got to, you know, get an opportunity to play so they can call home. Because they're like any other people, just there's no difference. Um, so can you tell me how you identify with regard to your social identities, broadly speaking? So race, ethnicity, which you've talked a little bit about, sexuality, gender, disabilities, religion, and so on. Okay. Every time I talk about my identity, there's like so many boxes. I don't fit into like one box specifically. Like, like I said, I'm Latino. I'm half Peruvian. I'm half Puerto Rican. I'm very proud of that. I wasn't in the past, but I have grown to love myself now. Um, sexuality wise, I'm bisexual. I really don't care about the person, but like bisexual, like the spectrum, like feminine, male, like masculine and anybody in between really. Um, I'm trans, as I said, I have been out for I think seven years now. Wow. Um, I came out when I was 12. Um, so that was very fun. The past seven years. I am not religious anymore. I, I don't know. My views on religion are very conflicted. I guess now my religious identity is more like agnostic. Like I may, there's maybe a God, but it's not like the version that organized religion makes us portray him or her or them as I think it's just like an entity that watches over us and you know guides us when we need it most I think I have to pay that a lot to my Catholic and Christian upbringing um but I'm not very religious now I have severe religious trauma because of that but I am aside from those identities I am disabled I do suffer from not suffer I hate saying that but I do deal with um, PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, and major depressive disorder. Um, they do impact my life daily, not as much as they have in the past, but they do it, you know, get in the way of doing basic things like even getting up in the morning or doing my homework. How long have you had PTSD and major depressive disorder? <sighs> I think, well... I can't really pinpoint my life like when it came up or when the symptoms really like started showing and people said something's wrong with him because you know people want to assume something's wrong if you're mentally ill or not doing all right but when I first got diagnosed I was around 11. Um, I just started middle school and the transition I think was really bad for me emotionally and mentally. Um, I was like self-harming. I could not process what was going on. I was losing friends. I was emotionally numb for like days at a time. And 
when I actually went to a therapist, it was because of a, a suicide attempt. And my mom begged me to go see a therapist and I did it for her sake. Um, that's when I, when I interviewed with the therapist, it's like a process, like you interview with a, a random therapist and then she assesses, assesses from what you tell her, um, what kind of like therapy you should go into and what might you possibly show symptoms for. And when I was put with my first ever therapist, she told me I was put with her because she was a trauma therapist because I had possible signs of trauma. And I was like, no, I don't. I have a really normal life. I'm relatively happy. I'm doing okay physically, financially, like to what I believed was okay. Um, so I told her like, I demanded basically, like I need you to test me for whatever it is that's wrong. And then she told me after like, what was like an hour and a half of testing, like screenings. They were general screenings just to see what signs you had. She told me that I had really like, strong signs for like PTSD and back then it was clinical depression but she said that the clinical depression would manifest into major depressive disorder um and it did as we know now but that's how I found out and I guess through years of therapy I kind of figured out like how I grew up wasn't normal and the signs were there it's just that everybody around me tried to deny it or they weren't well informed enough to understand that something was wrong as well as myself. So would you mind elaborating on what you mean by that when you say how I grew up was not normal? So only if you feel comfortable. Yeah, no. It's just like I'm trying to see how I can phrase this. Well, without going super into detail, my parents' marriage is not the greatest. And they did fight a lot, an unhealthy amount. You know, couples have their fights, they make up, and they understand. The thing that was wrong in that equation for them was that they didn't communicate what was wrong, and they didn't get outside help from that. So it went from verbal fights to physical fights, where sometimes my parents would have legal authorities involved, and it caused, it warped my perception of what was a healthy relationship or what was considered, like, the norm. Um, because for the longest time, I believed, you know, it's okay for somebody, your partner, to just basically throw you around if you mess up because that's how you learn because I was raised with corporal punishment if I did something I was hit um, as punishment to understand that it was not okay instead it just instilled fear in me that I should not provoke my parents again um, so I guess that's what I would consider like not normal also just the unhealthy relationships in general not just between my parents but between my mom and her siblings my dad with his siblings um even my dad's parents' own relationship like is not healthy. Like they, it's clear that they're not emotionally connecting anymore. Um, so I guess that's what I would consider as not normal. So what does it mean to you when you say that you're bisexual? Hmm. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Well, to me, like I know there's different labels for sexuality because sexuality is fluid it will always be fluid and it has always been fluid it's ever changing but to me bisexuality is like it's not more about your gender or sex it's i guess expression like i'm attracted to you no matter your sex or your gender if you express a certain way like if i see like oh you present masculine but you may be you might identify as a woman then shit okay <laughs> I'm attracted to you, um, you know, physically. Emotionally is a different thing, but I might find you nice to look at. It's the same with the guys who may be more feminine or who just are masculine. Like, I don't know. Sexuality, like bisexuality is the easiest way to explain it for me. It's also just, it doesn't box people. Um, I don't care what's your identity. I don't care what's in your pants, frankly. Just if I find you attractive, that's basically it. So what does it mean to you to be a trans man? <sighs> to me, you asked that question, like what does it mean to be trans? It's gonna differ with every trans person. I've never been able to define this for myself personally. I guess as a trans man, over the years I've realized it's more of like a negative experience. I, I wish that wasn't the case. I am proud to be who I am. I am so glad I came out. I was miserable before that, but I received nothing but like 
backlash for who I for who I am. Like you're going to be treated as a second class citizen. You are less than. You are not human. It's upsetting. It's awful. But sometimes it makes me feel ashamed for having come out and makes me realize like what if I did it come out and waited till I was in college? Maybe it'd be different because when I did come out, I was very young and people thought it was like a whole, that was, yeah, it was like a whole, oh, he's being brainwashed. He's being pushed this agenda, which I don't understand that whole thing. But I think being a trans man means there's going to be good and there's going to be a lot of bad, but you, you're going to have to push past it and understand that who you are as a person, it's how you determine it. it I can't, sorry, I can't live my life, <laughs> uh, you know, by everybody's definition of what it means to be a person. Like, I can't live my life being called, like, I can't live my life um, telling myself that I'm a freak because everyone else calls me that and say, oh, what I'm doing, what how I'm expressing myself and who I am as a person is wrong. It's not. Uh, not everyone's going to agree with it, but I guess that's what it means. There's a lot of bad. <laughs> so if you would, how would you distinguish trans masculinity from cis masculinity? <sighs> I don't think I can because masculinity is its own thing, really. What we determine as masculine is more like a societal thing. It's like, I'm just going to throw a random example. Um, like, I wear sneakers, and I wear baggy shorts, let's say, and I wear a hoodie. That's apparently masculine attire. And then if I wear something more like this, right? Like, this is more feminine attire. Um, which makes no sense to me, because clothes don't have a gender. They don't care. It's clothes. They're manufactured. But I guess, in a weird sense, trans masculinity, you are more, it's more acceptable for you to go outside of the of the norm when you're expressing yourself gender-wise. Like, gender expression is completely different from gender identity. It is not the same. I tell people that all the time. I may be a trans guy. I may be a guy. But if I want to dress feminine sometimes, I'm going to do that. That's just who I am. I don't care. Um, I think with cis masculinity, it's different because we expect cis men to be these, like, rough and tumble guys who get their hands dirty and have tools and at a young age want a power drill and whatever crap. Like, I really hate that. Um, but I think that's what it is. Like, if you're a trans guy and you try to express yourself masculine, it's just like, okay, whatever. Um, your masculinity as a trans man, it, it, I don't know, it does not matter to people because it's more socially acceptable in a weird way. But cis masculinity, you're, it's the only norm. You have to be masculine. So I guess that's how I would describe it. So do you think um, your experiences with trans masculinity could potentially lend some insight to um, to people who are cis masculine right, or cis men? I think so. I mean, I told, I've had a lot of cis guy friends over the years and a lot of them, you look at them and they're like, oh, that's a straight cis man. Like they, he goes and he has a girlfriend, he has a job and he works on on the garage in the garage with his dad every weekend some of them want to paint their nails and that's not a feminine or a masculine thing it's not gay or whatever people want to call it um, and i say go ahead just because you're cis doesn't mean that you that's not socially acceptable of course people are going to have different opinions about it but it's nails you can take it off you can put plastic ones on if you want you want to have those long acrylic nails that's fine um, just don't be an asshole. That does, that's, the, that's it. I tell people that, like, I've tried to be more accepting about my gender expression over the years because people expect that I've become this person and I, I'm trans that I have to adhere to masculine expression and to masculine norms, I guess. And I say, no, I'm still a guy. I can paint my nose if I want. It doesn't make me any less of a man. You wouldn't say that to some 6'2 cis white boy who paints his nails, which a lot of them are doing now. Um, so I guess I just tell people, it's just do what you want. It does not matter. You will live. Um, people will heckle whatever. People will throw their tantrums, but it's usually 50 plus year old like Republican conservatives who cry about every little thing. 
Um, so can you talk some about your coming out experience? What was the process like of um, figuring your identity out? And then um, how did people around you respond? So I remember in the months leading up to it, I was very conflicted about what was going on in my head. I had the whole, you know, I was just diagnosed with PTSD and depression and I was like, okay, wow. And then I started to go online and talk to people um, and realize, you know, that I don't have to adhere to certain norms for who I am as a person. That made me start to wonder, am I even comfortable in who I am? Am I depressed because something is not lining up in my body? Because I felt like something was off when I transitioned from elementary school to middle school. Even before then, like in fifth grade, like something was not going right. And it was a few months and I met with this lady. She was a kids in crisis lady. Um, Miss Caroline. Her her last name was something else. I don't remember. But we called it, I called her Miss Caroline. Amazing woman. Um, she did not specialize in this, by the way. Um, she specialized in like helping at-risk youth find a home and like make a plan or whatever. She she was just the only person available because all the other like mental health staff were awful. Um, but she like talked to me while I was having this mental breakdown because I was not doing okay and I was talking to her about what was going on and she said, you might want to do some research because it sounds like you know, you might have like gender dysphoria or something, something along those lines. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. And I did my research. I like found all these things online. I was overwhelmed. And then I brought it back to him. Like, I think I might be trans, but I don't know if it's okay for me to tell people that. I don't know if it's okay for me to tell people at, at 12, I'm not a girl. I'm a boy. That's what is going wrong in my body because people are going to react a certain way. She said, you know, well, we can figure something out. We made a plan about how I could socially transition at school. And that slowly started taking sh uh, shape. I came out socially to some of my friends. And then the next big step after that was tell the school and tell my mom. That was the thing I was most nervous about. Like, I could not muster up the courage to tell her for weeks. And then when I finally did, I still remember it to this day. We lived in our old apartment in uh, North Water Street, the, this was back home in Greenwich, and she was in the kitchen, she was chopping something, I remember she was cooking dinner, like around four or five, and I go up to her and I go, mommy, I need to tell you something, she goes, what is it, because she, she gets taken aback when you suddenly come up to her and you say, I need to tell you something, she thinks something's wrong, and she goes, what is it, you can't tell me anything, and I go, I'm transgender, I, I am not a girl, I I am a boy, I that's who I am. And I felt like I was gonna cry, like I felt like I was gonna throw up and cry at the same time. And I look at her and she's like wide eyed, she's like, okay, I support you 100%, you know I love you no matter what. I feel like crying and thinking about it, but she's like, it was like neutral, but she was just kind of stunned because she didn't know how to react to it. She was like, you know, I, I support you and I love you 100%, and we will do what we got to do to help you with this. And I felt so much better. I said, I'm like, okay, what are you making for dinner? <laughs> that was it. And it, it took a bit. But after that, she was my biggest advocate. I love her to death. She's an amazing woman. She's improved so much. But she's educated herself. She didn't know before. She didn't know about, you know, LGBTQ plus community or trans people. She didn't know about that. But she slowly but surely became my biggest ally and she like pushed for me to you know to be open about it at school and there wasn't any gender neutral bathrooms at, at my middle school at the time so she pushed for me to like um use the the men's uh restroom like the boys room because they kept putting me at the nurses uh restroom and i had to walk all the way across the other side of the building to do that and she's like that's not fair my son should not have to walk all the way to the other side of the building to have to go to the bathroom he should use the boys bathroom and so you know they did that and they let me do that and it was so liberating like having her by my side because I was so scared as a 12 year old what do you expect people to to do when you say I should use the other bathroom um but she was my biggest advocate whenever I came home and I, I had people 
bully me about it. Oh my god, I remember I was severely bullied in middle school for it. Like, I was called all sorts of slurs about it, and it was awful. It was humiliating. I hated going to school. I took more sick days than most people in that class. I remember one time, they were old friends. I don't talk to them anymore because of that, but they bullied me so much where they were calling me like the T slur, they were calling me the S slur. Um, they were calling me all sorts of things. And I told my mom that I didn't feel safe, that I was considering like taking my life, like I was not okay. And I said, I was going to deal with it. She's like, no, we can't just push this aside. You need to be okay at school. You need to be safe at school. And so she, I swear to God, she bolted to the school. She marched right in there. She's like, why the hell are you not doing anything about these kids that are bullying my son? He's over here struggling to come to class, suffering from this, and you're not doing anything. And they were like, we don't know. This is the first, like, we've tried to talk to them about it, like, but we didn't know it was this bad. And I still remember that, like, she just kept demanding, like, you need to do something about it or I'm going to get the parents involved and you don't want the parents involved. And then she pulled the whole, I'm going to sue you. And she, my mom's not the kind of person to do that, but she was serious. And I mean, it's been very positive since then with my mom. Um, she's still my biggest ally. She's still very supportive about it. My dad is still in denial about it. <laughs> he thinks it's a phase. He thinks I'm a lesbian. <laughs> so I told him like, no, like I told him in English and I told him in Spanish. Like he knows enough English to understand, but I think he's still in denial about it. He's, um, we've come to a, like a silent agreement, I guess. We don't, we didn't say it, but like, you know, don't say anything. Like, you know, the don't ask, don't tell rule that they had in the military. That was basically our pact. Like, you don't bring it up. We don't talk about it. We have a normal child father relationship. That was it. But I think it's gone harder for him over the years to accept that I'm not who I was. Um, I think he realized that when he put my actual, like my name, my preferred name on my high school diploma rather than my legal name. And he shook his head, but he didn't throw a whole fuss like he would have in middle school. Um, where he's like, oh, that's gross and that's wrong, blah, blah, blah. I think that's his own way of growing as a person. And it's going to take him longer than it did my mom, but I have faith in him. Aside from that, uh, my siblings were very supportive. Um, I actually inspired uh, I have three siblings, right? The next one after me actually came out like a few years after that. Um, so I inspired them to, you know, be who they are. They're very accepting. And I always remind them of that. Um, you know, I'm I'm always preaching tolerance and not tolerance, but like acceptance and love. So um, they're very much my allies as well. It's been positive besides that one person. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to say about um, your coming out process and how people around you responded? Mm, about that, I guess. Now, like my family, my extended family, and even my immediate family, they don't use my preferred name or my pronouns. Mainly at home, like with my immediate family, it's because of my dad. So we can't uh, use my preferred name or pronouns for me or my other sibling who has come out. We would love to, but it's just not safe for us to do so. And we don't, we want to be spared the whole rants about that and God or whatever. Um, with my extended family, they know about me coming out. They know about my other sibling, I'm pretty sure. But with my mom's side of the family, they just don't try. I guess it's something with other family members who may not be accepting. So it's better not to say anything. With my dad's side of the family, they're Catholic. Um, you know how that goes. So to spare ourselves and to be safe, we try not to. Does it make it hard for you to go home? Sometimes I have to switch into this completely other person um, and completely like negate parts of my life that don't exist. Like also because my family is somewhat like religious and they like to poke fun at certain things. Like I have to negate the fact that I'm, I had a boyfriend. I've been with him for like six years basically. Um, and that he knows I'm trans and that we are in a gay relationship that he knows that he's accepting that he's like I love him so much. Um, I'm not gonna rant about him, but um, I have to negate that and that I'm open and out to everybody at school like I go by my preferred name I use my, my pronouns my mom knows 
um, she makes sure that the school knows. Like she called me and said, "Dude, does, does the school know that you use this name and pronouns?" Like I gotta make sure they're doing that. And I'm like, "Yeah, man, it's fine." Um, but I have to like completely cut out parts of my life. Um, I say certain, I guess, say general things, but I just have to not say like, "Oh yeah, by the way, I don't identify as a as a woman anymore." <laughs> so I guess that's really it. Does it affect how close you feel to family members, not being able to talk about this part of yourself? I think so. A little bit. Um, with my dad, it's a different story, but part of it has to do with that. Um, we've gone slightly closer, I guess, over the years, but I think part of it has to do because he feels bad about what's happened. Um, and I think part of it has to do with my identity and how he can't really come to terms with it. Um, but we're just kind of like at a neutral standpoint right now. With my dad's side... It's more like I don't want to shatter this image of how great I am because for them, I'm the firstborn. So I'm going to college. I'm doing all this great stuff. I want to be a lawyer. Um, you know, I'm in California. Like, that's huge for them. That's like if I want a Nobel Peace Prize for them. Um, so I don't want to shatter that image for them because they'll think I'm a fraud or that I've been lying and I'm sitting or God knows what else. I don't know. My mom's side is just... It's hush hush they don't want to talk about it it's like sex it's taboo they don't want to speak about it it's best to leave it in the other room and come back to it later um so you said you had some very negative experiences in middle, middle school your friends bullied you yeah i had this trio of like guy friends who one i dated but that's different <laughs> it was a middle school relationship it does not matter but i was friends with them I was close with them um but when I came out it was completely different like they made fun of me like guys do because of, oh now he's actually one of the guys and they made fun of me for it but the guy I was with I guess technically he was very insecure about the fact that the girl he was with was now a guy or has basically never existed at that point um and I kept reminding him like that person you were with just think of it as she's dead. Like she's not around anymore. I'm a whole, com I'm a completely separate person of the other person. Like I'm not going to negate that being part of my life. It is part of my life. Um, it's a huge part of my life, but it doesn't matter anymore. And I don't understand why you have to be so insecure about it. But he just kept saying like, oh, it's gay. I'm, I'm not gay. I'm not a homo, whatever. Um, he kept just pushing that on to me. And I'm like, dude, I don't care. I know you're not does not matter um but you don't have to bash me for it because you're all of a sudden insecure and it just it was this insecurity that led to my bullying it was mostly taunting at first and they tried to play fight with me to the point where they pushed me on the ground and sometimes they like they restrained themselves but they would try to like push past play fighting um but it was mostly like slurs and taunting like it was bad um I'd be called all these things like I'd be, I'd be asked awful questions about my body and like if I had surgeries done to prepare me for surgeries. I was 12. Nobody's giving surgeries to a kid. Um, if I actually had like a dick a whole time or something like if I was, this is not acceptable, but like if I was a hermaphrodite, like it was wrong. It was bad. Um, and I felt like insecure about myself and my body and I hated it. And they'd tell me that I'd never be a man. I, I would never be what I, what I want to be, basically, is what they said. Like, I'm never going to be who I'm supposed to be and all that. And it got really bad where I didn't show up for school sometimes. And, like, they'd make threats about jumping me in this boy's bathroom. Like, I had to be escorted sometimes so to make sure I was safe. I had friends who were not doing that who later turned on me for some reason, I don't even know why, but out of that situation, out of the bullying, when it did get resolved and it got, I guess, fixed, I made new friends out of that. And I'm not friends with them anymore because it's a whole different story, not related to this. Um, I did grow with those people. I did bec uh, they showed me, you know, what it means to actually have a safe space and all that. And they created those safe spaces for me. I met other other queer students, which I never thought would exist. I was like, what, maybe one of five queer students at my middle school? It was crazy when I finally got to meet other people like me, and I was like, oh my god. Like, I wanted to cry. 
it was nice to have people who could relate, even if it wasn't other trans people. It was people who might have been gay or they, or they were lesbian or they were pansexual and they knew about the experience of being bullied because they were different. Um, so I, out of it, out of a really bad situation, I got not just a great ally out of my mom, but I also made good friends and I found spaces and I found a way to advocate for myself because out of that, I I definitely told myself, like, I can't let this happen again. And I need to advocate for myself more. And I have been. So I grew as a person. So was this all in Greenwich? Yes. Um, Greenwich, if you don't know about it, Greenwich, Connecticut, to be exact, it is, they like to say they're progressive, but they're really not. They're they're very much, le not left-leaning, sorry, right-leaning and conservative in their views. A lot of our, I guess, like our officials are Republican. Um, in terms of the education system, it's not. But, I mean, when it comes to certain topics like, you know, like, queer studies, let's say, right, you would talk about certain queer figures in history, it's very, like, very lightly touched upon. Like, imagine a pool of water, right, and you put, like, a single drop of blood. It goes in, and it immediately disappears. That's how it was learning about people like me. Like, when we, like, sophomore, i try trying to remember, sophomore American history, we very, very, very lightly touched upon, like, Marsha P. Johnson and like the AIDS epidemic and how it affected uh, certain queer people and queer communities, that was it. I was so pissed off about it that I I wrote a whole paper on it, uh, like the AIDS epidemic and how it affected specifically queer communities, communities around that area. I got an A on it, so I'm very proud of it. But yeah, where I came from, I mean, everybody's open about it, but it's just kind of like, eh, I don't want to hear it. Like, I know you are, but stop talking about it. I think now, since I've gone older and since I left, it's gone a little more open. Um, they have been talking about doing Pride over there, which is kind of fun. Um, but it's not like, just imagine the pool and the drop of blood. That's really what it is. It's hush, not hush hush to the extreme where you get killed. Just like, who cares, basically. What's the class and racial makeup of Greenwich? Ooh, heesh. Um, so if I were to like visually represent it, it's mostly white, but it's like white and then Asian people and then Hispanics and then black people. Like Asians and white people are like the majority basically. Um, there comes us and then the black population is not very big over there, which is understandable. I wouldn't want to live in a town that made fun of me like that. I've seen how it impacts black students. I'm not going to speak on it because it's not my experience, but I have had black friends who have been impacted personally and it's disgusting. I'm just gonna call it out, I don't care, it's disgusting. Um, I've had people like me, Hispanic students who have been affected by it. Um, I have, not so much, it's more the trans thing. Um, they're like, yeah, you're brown, whatever, but the whole trans thing, that's a problem. Um, like they've been made fun of like their culture and their language and how oh, all this stuff, especially with the whole Trump thing, but that's a different story. Um, but yeah, it's mostly white students, and then all of the rest follow. On top of that, um, it's also very, like, socioeconomic, like, class separate, like, with class, like, wealth, I guess. Like, yeah, you can be white, but if you're poor white, you're not sitting with the well-off white kids. Um, and then you have, let's say, like, you're well-off, like, black kid. Sure, you can sit with us, but just not so close where everybody can see us, basically. They didn't want to admit there was a segregation pro problem because all the students naturally segregated each other, which is really depressing to think about. But all the colored students would sit with each other, right? All, all, all the people of color would just sit together and then all the white students would sit together and then it was also then separated by class and nobody wanted to address it. There was a problem and I'm like, there's a problem here because I, I sit anywhere near like let's say the wealthy kids at the table over and they look at me like I did something wrong, like I committed a, a war crime. It's like, I didn't do anything but sit next to you, eat this cardboard pizza that they say is edible. Yeah, that's Greenwich. So do you think all of that privilege, that race and class privilege, shaped your experience with um, anti-trans uh, behavior? I think so. Um, I think it also shaped my identity as a, as a Latino person, personally. 
um, I was I was dealing with like some internalized racism. Who wouldn't be in, in that time? I'm pretty sure like 90% of the, of the of the POC students were suffering with that. Um, I'm not the first, but also the whole not just the wealthy and the white kids, but also like if you're cis, you know, you're considered normal, you're the norm, whatever. Um, that also shaped my identity as a trans person and how I saw myself because I didn't consider myself normal or the norm or the standard, whatever they wanted to call that. Um, yeah, I felt guilty about a lot of things because of those kids. And I'm not putting them entirely at fault. They didn't know. They were clad in that whole privilege thing. They live in cushy homes. They, they're well off. They don't have to, you know, be ashamed of going to school or something or struggle to get by government assistance. They're fine. It's not their fault, really. It's just that they're not educated. Like, their parents didn't educate them. Sounds like the school didn't educate them either. No, they did not. They just perpetuated that whole, the whole segregation and the whole, not just the race segregation, but the class segregation. And also, in a way, the gender segregation. Like, it wasn't just, like, cis male and female students. It was also, like, you know, if you were trans, you were, like, with the other queer students. Um, all the Christians were by themselves, no matter the color, like it, it did not matter what race you were, it was just, you were there because nobody wanted to sit next to you. And it wasn't like a whole, ew, icky, trans person, ew, gross, a gay person, it was just, okay, your table's over there, by the way. It was not good. I'm glad I left. So this is high school and middle school? Yeah. Middle school, middle school not so much, but I think as you get older, it transitions more into high school. High school was bad. It was severe. Um, I really did not like where I went to high school. I was I hated that town. I'm glad I, I I'm really glad I left. I could not see myself raising my children there. Um, but the kids who are like me, who are whether they're like queer or they're brown or they're black or whatever, who are still there, I feel like personally speaking, they've been brainwashed into accepting that as the norm. Like the behaviors that were perpetuated by the wealthy well off white cis people but that's too controversial to say so in the curriculum you already talked about how queerness really was sort of a drop in the bucket like wasn't really talked about hardly at all and when it was it just sort of evaporated yeah <laughs> um were the histories or experiences of people of color talked about at all in the curriculum that you remember they made sure because i don't think they wanted to be called out for not talking su like super to an extent like about slavery we all know about it we know about the awful history that comes to enslaved black americans and how they suffered and how the people continue to suffer today because let's be real it's a correlation um and we know about that but they never talked about the triumphs of those communities it was always the black trauma stories at least that's how i'm seeing it it may be different for black students who actually were in that class but there was maybe one to every 30 kids in that class like I'm being serious it was like half a black student there um and it was the same for you know Hispanic or like brown issues the thing is brown issues aren't as talked about in in history like in history classes um and then like Asian issues like Asian or Pacific Islander stories are not talked about as often in the class queer topics aren't even talked about as often so I barely got to talk, like, like understand like what my people did in history, like in American history, just surrounding communities, because there was like maybe half a unit on it, and it was maybe on like how, you know, Mexican immigrants in the fifties came over here and they were treated like crab, basically like sprayed down for because they believed they had fleas because they considered them animals, and that was it. Nothing about Puerto Rican history. No. I very rarely got to learn about my own personal history. Um, everything I've learned about my myself and my history, my people's history is online, all my own personal research, which is unfortunate. Also my parents. I always ask, I like picking my parents' brain up, brains about that. Um, but it's unfortunate because it's just kind of like a generalized, like pulling people into these different little things, like as unit, like if let's say you had a history class, right, in high school, and you want to touch touched on every single community that you could about like their issues. The main ones would be the black community, white community, and then maybe some brown issues, and then maybe if you're lucky, some Asian issues. Let's not even talk about other communities who may be involved. You know, like like those who may be from the Middle East or like 
not even just like non-generalized like white topics like what about Europe like that's greatly touched upon in American history but like minority communities in Europe like let's say something like that it's all very generalized so we didn't really get to learn much about that so what does it feel like emotionally to figure out your identity um, or identities and do you feel happy and empowered in your identity as queer and trans? I do. I I feel liberated not having to live in this, I don't like to say closet, I like to say like this like cage because I can see outside of it how I'm supposed to live but I keep myself in it because I'm scared like before, before I came out like I feel scared that something's wrong wrong is gonna happen and that's part of why I didn't come out for a bit because I was scared I would face um the consequences of my actions for coming out but I'm happy honestly having come out I'm in a very great relationship with my boyfriend he's accepting which is one of the first times I've ever been accepted as a, as a trans man in a relationship because they're always thinking that it's you know, not technically gay because I'm still biologically female, which is not at all true. It's a man, it's a man. If they identify as that. Um, it's, it's all their own insecurities though, but I feel very happy in my identity as a person. I've become very dissatisfied with my life actually, yeah. Is there anything you're looking forward to with regard to your identity that you feel like, um, yeah, what do you see in your future? Possibly changing my name, but that's a whole process I have to go through and I have to pay like four hundred something dollars for that and medical like medically transitioning is still way down the road. Like I can't afford that. I'm barely trying to even get insurance for that. Um it's still like a long way down. But yeah, I feel like sometime either this year or down the line I will eventually get to change my name so it can legally be me go, yeah. Um, so under what context do you publicly disclose your identity as bi and trans? So, it's mostly like I disclose, like, I actually did it today in my public speaking class. Um, if I have an opportunity to introduce myself in a new class, I will immediately say, you know, my name is Mako, uh, I'm 19, I am trans, I use he, him pronouns, like I disclose it immediately because I know that if I don't, I'm going to regret it and then I'm going to have to deal with all of this like misgendering crap. Um, in terms of like my sexuality, I don't really disclose that to people because it's not really not any of their business. If I'm with like close friends and they're talking about their own romantic and sexual life, I'm like, yeah, shit, I'm bisexual, I know how that, that is. Um, not in super grotesque detail but I just say you know about my sexuality and my experience but if it's about my gender identity I try to disclose that as soon as possible in any setting when I'm meeting new people um if I'm at like at work I had to disclose it to the lady who was hiring me like I told her hey by the way um I'm trans I use a different name that's well, that what's in my legal documents and I use uh he him pronouns and they have a system where they have to put my name into it so she said that they could still accommodate to it, but certain legal things they couldn't change, and I said that's fine. As long as the things you can't accommodate to for me as a trans person are accommodated too. Because I understand legal things can't be changed, it's legal. Um, I have to live with that for a bit, but if you can make accommodations for me to feel safe in the workplace and to feel accepted, then yeah, do it. How has your experience been at work? You said you are at Jamba Juice? Yes. Uh, it's been pretty good. Uh, I get occasionally uh, misgendered sometimes, but they immediately like say like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I forget. Like it's a new experience for people because I'm usually like the first trans employee they get at the workplace. And it's, it's fun sometimes having to educate people, but it gets tiring having to deal with customers because my philosophy is if I'm gonna, like, gonna see them once, what's the point of having to disclose my identity? I'm just there to serve you and give you a drink and you have, you know, wish you a good day. If they're a regular customer, I make sure to disclose it and, you know, say like, hey, by the way, blah, blah, blah. Um, that at work has been very accepting. Everyone uses my pronouns. Everybody's very respectful. They know me as only Mako, except like the hiring manager, like she knows, but she does not disclose my legal name. She can't. So, <laughs> um, but she's very supportive. All of them are. Um. Yeah.
it's been very positive. I really like my job and that the basic decency, like the, the human respect just, I guess, adds to it because you don't get treated as a human being sometimes for being who you are. So I want to transition, I think, if that's okay, yep. to talking more about disability, but is there anything else you want to say? Anything you want to elaborate on about things we've already talked about so far no. that you can think of? Um, so you talked some about your disability, PTSD, major depressive disorder. Um, is there anything else you want to say about that, especially how they affect you on a daily basis? And Yeah. Um, like right now, um, if I seem very slow, it's because I'm in and out of dissociation. Um, which, if you don't know, it's my consciousness is basically leaving my body and I'm not there. But it's like I kind of like blank out, basically. It's like zoning out to the extreme, I guess. Um, except I can't go back in willingly. It takes me a bit. But um, that's one of the things that affects me on an everyday basis is that I dissociate. And it's not on command. It's just whenever. Because my body thinks I'm experiencing some sort of traumatic trigger. And it needs to shield me from it. As my therapist told me, it's a coping mechanism that you use. And I guess I must have used it when I was growing up now that I think about it, um, but now I can't control it. So it's very risky for me. I actually had to explain this to my boyfriend a few weeks ago, I think it was, or when I first came here, I don't remember. Also that concept of time, it's very tricky for me to understand concept of time now because all my memories are very foggy, I guess. Like I can't tell you like if something happened two weeks ago or three years ago. Um, remembering like recalling is very hard like I have also short-term memory loss I, I forget what I'm doing if I walk into a room I completely forget and I get really frustrated um and I have to retrace like physically retrace my steps into like okay why did I come into the kitchen from coming out of the bedroom I wanted to get a snack what kind of snack did I want it was not practice like I have to do that whole thing like I'm a child it feels awful because I'm not I don't know, I'm not normal to people. So people think sometimes like I need extra care. Like when I tell them that, like, oh, how can you live like that? It's like any other person. I just try not to disclose that to people that I have memory, like I have struggles for recalling memory or I dissociate. Like I said, with the dissociation part before I cut myself off, um, this is an example. It affects me to the extreme where like I will dissociate in the middle of a busy street and there will be oncoming traffic and I will literally my body physically stops in the middle of oncoming traffic and I could get run over it has happened so many times now especially since I've moved here because I think I'm still adjusting to it being in a new setting and being away from my family because my mom understood she also was my biggest advocate for that I love her so much for that but she understood why all of a sudden I started dissociating because I could just grab her arm and she would guide me because I can't see when I dissociate, it's all foggy. It's like if I took off my glasses, I can barely see you. That's how it is when I dissociate. Um, but I had to, I don't wanna say train, but I guess train my boyfriend to understand that. And it sucks because I have to depend on people and I'm very independent, being the eldest of four. I was also raised by a Puerto Rican mother and I was raised by my mom in general. So she's very independent and she raised me to be very independent. So that's how it affects me. It makes me feel like I'm being babied, I guess. But the memory, the dissociation, uh, I get just, I don't know, it's, it's bad. And the depression doesn't help either. And, you know, the classic, like I get unmotivated, I get sad. But because of that, those two things, I also get emotionally numb. It wasn't as extreme as when I was like 12 years old. Um, but when I was 12, I would become like straight up like emotionally numb. Like I did not feel anything for like sometimes weeks. And people thought like something was wrong. Uh, but it's like I, I could not tell you if I felt sad, if I felt angry. I just felt eh. That was all I could say. And it frustrated me because I couldn't voice how I was feeling. Physically speaking, um, I couldn't eat solid foods for a bit. Um, I have like these like waves where I my body will not allow itself to eat physical foods because of my depression because it said screw it we're not eating physical foods today so I have to drink heavy liquids 
and so I'm hungry the entire day. Because I don't experience it as much now, but because of this, I have a I have accustomed myself. I guess I've made it a habit to not eat in the morning, so I can't eat in the morning. Um, I don't eat a lot of meals in, in throughout the day because I'm scared that something's going to trigger and I won't be able to eat. It affects me in a lot of ways, not just mentally, emotionally, physically. It affects me as well. It's it puts me in very dangerous situations, so I have to be very cautious about where I'm going, who I'm going with, what I'm doing. Like, if I'm driving, I have to be very careful. I don't, thankfully, but um, when I do decide to, to do that next big step, that's what's been uh, throwing me off, like, making me hold back. And I can't tell that to my mom because she thinks I'm being lazy. But it's because, like, I'm scared I'm going to dissociate in the middle of a freeway. And I want to swerve and God forbid I have someone in a car like my brothers or my or any of my siblings and I crash. I don't want to be responsible for that. So that's how it affects me. So can you talk some about your needs as somebody who's disabled in the classroom? Uh, my needs. Like what kind of accommodations do you think would help you in the classroom? Well, I've had have I have had this experience in high school where I needed to have accommodations made for my disabilities. Um, not so much now in college, but like if I did have accommodations now, I feel like I don't know. I don't really need them. Like everybody functions differently. Like everybody needs accommodations according to who they are. I feel like I'm in a well enough place where it's just like sorry, I'm in a well enough place where it's just like. I don't know, I, I try to push through it and just kind of keep going forward. Maybe it's my whole, like, I don't know. I don't want to say this, but this whole, like, ableist way of thinking I have because of how I grew up back home and it was very not pro-disabled and very not pro-accommodations, I guess. Um, I try to remind myself not to think like that. Like, if I need accommodations, I should use them because it is my right and I should use them. But... I don't know, in a weird, awful way, I don't feel like my needs are as strongly need. I don't know, I don't need accommodations as much as I used to back then. I guess in a way, just for teachers to be more understanding, that if I may be a little slower in class, like how I start speaking and I start shutting down, it's because, not because I'm bored, not because I'm tired, it's because my conscience is literally leaving my body and I'm not there physically. Well, if they're physically not there, like, emotionally, I guess, or mentally, I don't understand, I don't know how to say it, but and it's just for them to be more understanding that there's some days where I'm just not there, and I shouldn't be penalized for it, I guess. So, do you think that your identities as um, bi and trans relate to your disabilities, shape your disabilities, and vice versa? How do they intersect, do you think? Uh, it's a very broad question, I realize. Yeah. I don't know. I can you say it again? Sorry. Yeah. So, like, how do you think your identities as both disabled and as somebody who's trans and queer um, kind of shape your experiences? All right. Uh, well, I'm not sure. I've been told that in a weird way, because of who I am, I'm really, really. Uh, progressive I guess and severely left-leaning I see it now that I I am but I see it more as like I'm trying to advocate for the basic bare minimum for people like I'm not asking for a lot I'm just asking for the bare minimum um how they shape my experience yeah I'm very much the first person to call shit out if it's not okay um I am very much the first person to stand up for somebody who was unable to advocate for themselves, but in a way where it's still respectful for them because I understand personally how that feels um, to be spoken for and not to have yourself voice what's wrong. You know, to give them that push, basically. Um, I understand how that is, but I guess also in that same sense, it makes me more empathetic towards people because I can't understand how other people can hate each other for certain things. Um, like with racism, I don't get it. I really don't. Um, or the whole anti-trans thing that's going on lately. I don't get it. Maybe because I am trans and I understand it. But like if I wasn't, 
and I was not before a long time ago in another life. Um, I never even saw how you could even shape kids into hating a group of people who have done nothing wrong to them. And if anything, have pushed for more acceptance of their community and for other communities, in fact, and over the years than anybody else. Um, so I guess in a way, they have pushed me to be more accepting of others and to put myself in their shoes, as people would say. Walk on my own in their shoes, I guess. And be more empathetic and... Um, understand why they may be voicing certain things and certain needs and why they may be paid by certain like for example systems um rather than just like shut it down and say oh it's because you're x y and z you're being annoying you're whining it's like hear them out first they may have something to say so you mentioned towards the beginning of the interview um that you identify sort of as trans, not transcultural, tricultural, <laughs> um, that with one parent from Puerto Rico and the other from Peru. So how does that, how does being a second generation Latino shape your life? Oh, okay. Um, I know, big again. I know, yeah. It's just like I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to process how I'm going to answer this because when I was younger, when I first moved to Greenwich, I was around eight. I lived there for about 10 years after, then after I graduated, I left, but the first few years of my life, I think up until like high school, I hated being brown. I'm just going to be honest. I hated it. I love the food. I, I like the music, but like back then, like I like those two things, but I hated my skin color. I hated that I was different. I hated my hair color, I guess, the, the texture, like how big it is. Like this is normal for right now. Usually it gets really big because I have a lot of thick hair. And for Peruvians, that's pretty much normal. Um, I hated my features. I hated it. Um, sometimes when I was little, I didn't understand why we had to speak Spanish um, because everybody else spoke Spanish. But I think once I pushed past that and I understood that there was other people who were like me that had similar experiences and we shared like, oh yeah, haha, we got made fun of for who we were. But we grew past and understood that that shouldn't make us feel ashamed of our cultures. Like, I grew to love myself. And I do identify as tricultural, I guess. I was born in the U.S. I am an American citizenship because of birth. But I also have Peruvian citizenship because of my father. And I love being Peruvian. I love being Puerto Rican. I love my cultures. I love the music. I love the food. I love my people who advocate for the injustices that are happening right now. I don't know if you know what's going on in Peru, but very quick context, uh, old president tried to dissolve Congress and then the other president took over. She did a lot of bad things, this new president, and there's been a lot of injustices uh, against the indigenous communities there. And I like how my people have risen up to fight against it and they're not gonna take it, they're not gonna take it at all. Um, I'm proud of that, I'm proud of my language now. Um, I try not to negate it as much as I did when I was younger because I was really ashamed of being this color like I tried to purposely not go in the sun as much because I tan very easily I'm in there for like two minutes and I come out in a whole different shade but I would try really hard not to like tan in the summer because I didn't like how dark I would get um because then I would get made fun of for that um but no I don't really care I like being tan I like tanning I, at least I'm not gonna get skin cancer <laughs> so um but I don't know I I just it took me a while. It was a really long journey to get there to accept myself um, and to love who I am culturally. And now I just love wanting the fact that I can speak Spanish fluently and I can understand it. I mean, most of the population can, but it's cool to know two different types of Spanish because Peruvian Spanish is very different from Puerto Rican Spanish and very different from the Spanish that's spoken in different parts of the U.S. And the U.S. Spanish that people say is spoken, which is a mixture of different things depending on where you're from. And I like it. I like my customs, I like my traditions, so I'm proud of it. So yeah, I am tricultural. Um, I guess a similar question to what I asked before, but do you see, how do you see your identity as a second generation Latino sort of intersecting with your identity as um, queer or trans? I think um, it also plays a part into my trans identity because when I came out and I did meet other trans people or I saw other like you know, like, trans content creators on YouTube or, like, Instagram or stuff, it was all white people. I never saw a trans person of color, and I'm like, 
that's weird. Uh, I guess they don't exist. Like, am I the first person to come out as happens to be brown? Like, that's weird. Um, and I felt kind of ashamed because of that, that it wasn't normal. Or that my community wasn't as progressive as the white community to accept something like that. Um, when I did eventually uh, find people who looked like me or were a similar shade or um, understood the POC trans experience, uh, I felt better about who I was. I felt loved and included because my voice was being heard or at least, you know, I had a place to talk about my experience and I had people to talk about similar experiences as being POC trans people, I guess. Um, yeah, my identity as a second generation Latino plays a lot into who I am, I guess. I'm very much an advocate for my people's uh, issues. I, Especially when the whole Trump immigration thing happened, I was the first one to put that down. Like, I was the first one to shut it down when certain people were like, why don't they just immigrate here legally? It's like, well, some of us can't. And I should know because my some people in my family, not going to name names, had to do that to survive. Because... We make it extremely impossible to do that. I don't understand why it takes somebody who works their ass off, has to work three jobs to feed their family and send money back home, and is a better U.S. citizen than most U.S. born people here. They don't get the right to be called a U.S. citizen until, like, sometimes until they die. It takes forever. Like, the minimum is 13 years. But I have known people longer than that, or have been here longer than that, who have never gotten, gotten citizenship. Um, and it was very, it's very shameful to think about. It's very disappointing to think about. So I guess, yeah, my identity as a second generation Latino has to do, like it impacts me personally because I feel very strongly about these issues because not only have they personally impacted me, I see how they impact others, not just cis, cis straight Latinos, but also queer Latinos who don't either align with the, the spectrum or, or do or are allies who have family who are impacted because some people who seek asylum who are queer it's because their communities don't accept who they are as a person um so yeah that's pretty much it <laughs> so can you talk some about your class backgrounds or growing up and also in the present day how would you define your class status uh i would say i guess from what i know like connecticut classifies people who are low income who make around 30,000 to 35,000 or less a year. My mom makes that much. Like we live in public housing and it's like the shitty kind of public housing. No disrespect to Greenwich public housing, but it is shit. Um, my mom made it nice though. She made a home out of it. Cause she's like that. But I would classify us as, I would classify myself still as low income because I'm trying to get, you know, government-run programs for assistance and all that. I used to live off food stamps before my mom, for some reason, made a little too much more than the bracket and no longer qualified for it. Uh, luckily, you know, she's not struggling, but I don't know. We weren't, like, struggling day to day, but we were also, like, cushy and able to do things that other families in my neighborhood were able to, do, like, go to Cabo for the weekend or some shit like that or afford the the fancy snacks as i would say um yeah i i guess that would be it i classify myself as low income i still am i work a minimum wage job i'm going to school full time and i'm paying thousands of dollars for out-of-state tuition and can barely afford it sometimes without government aid i literally have an efc like an estimated family contribution of zero because my parents make that little much money like they don't make enough to even contribute a hundred bucks to my tuition, which I don't want them to. They have three other mouths to feed. Another one is leaving the nest for, for college soon. They have to think about them. I have to worry about myself. And they're willing willing to support me financially, but I can't do that to them. My mom is working basically two jobs, managing two stores back home. Uh, she works at this artisan donut shop. Um, Duck Donuts, check it out. It's pretty good. <laughs> I'm not trying to promote, I'm not sponsored or paid, but... Um, She's managing, you know, two stores out because she does such a good job as a person and she's very good at what she does. Like, it is crazy. She is slaving away at what she's doing just to put, you know, make us have a cushy enough life as, I guess, a little bit good people, what we classify as um, cushy, I guess. 
Um, so do financial stressors ever make it difficult to concentrate on your coursework? Sometimes. Um, it's not like I'm constantly worrying about it. I'm lucky enough where I do have some financial aid and I have some in my savings where I can pay off slowly like my tuition. But sometimes I worry that I might not be able to graduate. Like now that it's now that I'm starting my second year, I'm really scared that I'm not going to pay it on time, and they're not going to be able to um, let me transfer because I want to transfer to UC Davis in the fall, and I'll be able to qualify for UC tuition then, and I'll be able to get um, hopefully the blue and gold plan, whatever the hell it's called. Like I can get reduced tuition, but I'm scared that if I don't pay it, they won't send my transcript, and I won't be able to walk on stage and my family would have flown out for nothing because tickets are expensive for my family nobody can afford two thousand plus dollars for six people to come over to california for a week um even living here is expensive compared to back home like it is crazy how much i i spend like five hundred dollars a week for basic necessities i also don't help that i overspend sometimes but like basic things it's just I, I get scared that I'm not going to have enough to graduate or have enough of my savings to pay off tuition or enough of my savings to get me what I need to get by. I luckily have like my boyfriend's mom to rely on sometimes, but I'm an adult. I have my own expenses to take care of, and I don't want to rely on people. So yeah, I, I get scared, and it makes me worry that I should probably drop out of school if I can't afford uh to graduate, which I have thought about before, and I've talked to my boyfriend about it. Um, and he said that he told me like it's not worth it because we're already halfway through. The, you know, the two years you have to be at ARC, and I'm like, I know, but I'm just scared that I'll be denied what I worked so hard for, um, and what my parents sacrificed for me because I didn't pay like four thousand dollars to a school that's basically financially screwing me over. So it's funny that you say that you think you overspend, but it's easy to overspend when you don't when you don't have that much money. Yeah, you constantly probably feel like you're overspending. It feels like okay because anything you buy is overspending. Yeah, everything I buy is like too much. It's like if I want to buy like shampoo and conditioner for the week because shampoo and conditioner now lasts me a while. Like I try to save as much as I can, but if I want to get like a little box of muffins, it's like thirty bucks for that shit. It's like. It makes me really insecure about how I'm spending because then I think I'm overspending and I'm being impulsive. You know, it's something I'm trying to train myself to not do. But then I feel so ashamed for having spent something I, I know I deserve as like a little treat for myself. Or if I want to treat my boyfriend like to dinner, because we try to go on date nights as much as possible. But living here has not helped my financial insecurity. I feel I feel more financially insecure now than I have living back home. Which is not good. Do you ever access um, any of the resources that are offered on campus? Like through the Beaver Cares program, like food pantry, that sort of thing? I haven't. Because usually when they hold like stuff like the vegetable drive thingy that they have, it's usually during class hours, so I can't go. Or I don't qualify for it. Like I tried to sign up for CalFresh. And um, I don't know, like I don't qualify for it or something. I don't know. Like... I also don't feel like I'm in that much dire need because I have a roof over my head. I have people, you know, who can help me that I don't need it. But it's like when I do leave that place and I go to UC Davis and then I graduate UC Davis, like what resources am I going to have available to help me get by? Um, I just, I don't know. It's like my own thing. Like I'm not on the streets begging for money, so I don't really need to take these resources from other people. Like I'm fine. That's stupid mentality of mine yeah well, i don't think you're alone in thinking that way yeah i know a lot of people suffer with that shitty voice in their head telling them you don't need it you're fine but it's like i do need it <laughs> um so anything else you want to say about class no that's pretty much it how about growing up anything about what it was like growing up you said you lived in uh, public housing yeah, my family still lives there. Um, my name's actually still on the lease um, because my mom's scared. She said, God forbid something happens to you. I don't want my child to live on the street. I don't want you paying $200 in rent because it's a whole paycheck. And I'm like, I know you don't. I love you for that. But you need to think about your other kids um, because they tried to like upcharge her like $200. Also, public housing is a scam. 
they try to this is back to what I was saying just now they try to charge you like two hundred dollars for a for I don't know like rent like two hundred on top of her rent and it's already low but it's like too much for her because I'm I had a job at the time and I was 17 they they were forcing her to make me pay rent which she fought against that she's like I'm not having my son pay an entire paycheck to stay here he's still a minor he's still my son and even if he wasn't he's still at school God forbid she loves saying that something happens um I don't want him to be on the street paying me money for a house he doesn't live in it's it's stupid but yeah growing up I wasn't really ashamed of it until I realized how well off British kids were and then I felt really ashamed for having uh living lived the way I lived I I don't care now I'm just like okay whatever but back then I was really ashamed of that um does your class background and your current class status that sort of uh, affect your sense of belonging in a college classroom at all your sense of comfort uh, I don't think now because a lot of college kids are in the same boat as me because the, most of them are on their own and they're dealing with their own finances and some of them do come from low income families so we you know we joke around like if I connect with somebody I'm like oh we're on the same boat so I don't feel as like ashamed or as uncomfortable as I would have back home um, it's just more like I'm stressed that I'm not going to graduate uh, that's really it. But I feel safe, I guess, and fine knowing that other people can relate to my experience, I guess. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to transition to talking about ARC. Okay. Your experience so far. Mm -hmm. So, so far, what do you like most about being a college student? I don't know. I like all of it. It's literally like what I thought it would be like not really I I just don't know how to explain it I know I don't feel like much more independent I have been my entire life but I guess I feel like now that I'm actually responsible for myself legally and for my finances and all that that um it I feel like an actual adult it's stupid to say that but like I feel like an actual adult and nobody can take that away from me as like they would have if I was a minor and I felt that way uh because I'm like I'm a legal adult. I can do what I want. If I wanted to go splurge on like $20 ice cream, I could do that. If I wanted to go to, back to school willingly, like I can go to school willingly because I want to. Not like back home because you're forced to, you're a minor, you have to go to high school. But I'm taking classes I want. I'm trying new things. That's what I like about college. You try new things. You meet new people. People who may be like-minded like you or may not agree but they're not gonna throw it in your face that they don't agree and treat you like some like a subhuman they'll be like okay i may not agree with it but whatever and then they'll take you out for god knows what like a hot dog or something i don't know um i guess what i like about it is that i've met more people that are like-minded and open-minded than i have back home but it's also california so that's probably why um but I think universally with any college campus you can find that because you grow out of your comfort zone which is like your hometown and your high school and you meet different people like international students people from like 30 miles away two miles away they're five minutes down the street you know all that so I guess that's what I like it's been a very fun experience I feel very much liberated being a college student are there any professors or classes that stand out for you as um that you appreciated in particular just in general oh uh yeah actually now i think about it my ethics class my professor dylan which if he ever sees this for some reason i really liked his class um i took it because i thought it'd be interesting because my counselor said oh uh you should take it because you want to be a lawyer you should you know have some sort of background in it and i'm like okay sure i took it i loved it and i kind of want to minor in philosophy um, cause why not? Uh, I learned about the different ways of thinking and the different ways we can like process things or categorize things like is it morally, not morally okay, but like morally permissible for, well, for somebody to suggest euthanasia or like a certain type of euthanasia. Like that's one of the topics we talked about and like the different categories of ethics, like bioethics, that's what it is, like medical ethics. Like, there's so many different ways of, like, thinking and, like, 
processing something, there's like not one direct thing, which is what I've been used to my whole life, like just one thing, like one boxing, one thing. But there's different ways of doing that. You can take like Kant's the theontological ethics, I think that's what it's called, and I butchered it. But like I could process how Kant's ethics works into if it's okay for if it's morally permissible for somebody to offer the option of voluntary act active euthanasia. I think that's what it was, or like Mills, who was like, uh, Mills, yeah, utilitarianism, like the whole happy thing. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but like, if that's okay, because it's the greatest pleasure they can experience if they're released from that pain. Um, I don't know. There's different ways of thinking about it, so I think that's why I liked it, because I didn't have one answer. It's like, I can use different things and then answer it that way. And if somebody could uh, say no, we could actually see it this way. So it gave me a new way of thinking and processing things, and I think I'm definitely going to take more philosophy classes after that. Um, oh, forgot my question. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess my next question is, so have you, what's, what's been your experience taking courses that either wholly or in part um, focus on queer and trans topics? I know you've only been um, at ARC for one academic year, but have you had any experiences? Uh, unfortunately, I've only had, like, somewhat of an experience in my English 302 class, no, 301, sorry, not 302, 301 class with Kathy. Uh, Kathy Ariano, but it was like one of the books we studied um, and talked about queer topics in uh, a Mexican American or Chicano sense. What was that book? It was. You can remember. Sorry to put you on no, the spot. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, it was Gorda by Jaime Cortez. That's what it was. I'm sorry for my accent, but yeah, Gorda by Jaime Cortez. That's what it was. And I talked about his experience as a. Uh, a gay brown man and then it was basically like indirect ways of telling his own story with different characters and like one character was this like gay hairstylist and his experience growing up as a younger uh gay brown boy in i don't know what it was what town it was and then going like oh watsonville um and then um like how he built his reputation on it. he's like i'm not gonna shy away from it just because people don't like me I'm the, what did he say oh the local town fruit people love me for that i can make their wives and girlfriends hot and i don't overcharge them or something like that like i liked how it was comedic but it still highlighted some of the um harder topics to talk about that and th th it did it not so like wow in the face it was like yeah it was like normal it was um Watsonville, the play by Ch uh, Chiri Mora Morega, I think it was? Chiri Morega. There it is, that one. I loved that play. I have it. I still have it. I bought it. Um, and it talked about, you know, who was it? I think it was Susana or something. I don't remember her name. It's been a bit. I had to, like, block it out after I finished reading it. But, like, her experience and Juan's experience, like, the ex-priest, um, like, his experience as a priest and his values and beliefs. And then the whole plot twist with like Lucha and Susana actually being to each other and then disclosing it in the letter. Um, I don't know. It wasn't like the big thing like, wow, she's coming out. I was like, yeah, by the way, they like each other. No big deal. She made it very just like normal. I think that's what I liked about it. Also, the play's amazing. So I would read it again if I could. Um, so is that your first experience taking a class and having whole books focus on queer and trans topics? I don't think it's been my first experience because I've read other books that had queer topics in them. But I mean in a class. In a class, yeah. yeah. In a class that's probably like where it didn't go and it disappeared like the drop of blood. Like it was slightly pink but it, it could still be more. Um... So what value do you find in like being in a class that talks about queer and trans topics? Why do you think that might be important? I think for like people like me, it's good to see representation about ourselves. It's good to know that we have people who have shared similar experiences and that we're represented in media. That's the big thing, that we have representation. I get very little of that as a, not just a, a brown man but a brown trans man and a disabled brown trans man you know i have maybe the one representation of disability in media and then maybe two for being brown and then a few for being trans but it's not all together 
Um, so I think knowing that there's just like voices that are in a sense similar to mine, it makes me feel represented and people actually give a damn about people like me and people who may be in a similar boat. I think especially people who are struggling with their identity or figuring out not just their identity, but how to help others who may identify differently. It's like, how can I understand their voice and their situation? Shit, somebody who might, you know, be represented in media, who is like my friend, I can understand that in a sense. Not completely, but at least help pave the way for them to be comfortable and create a safe space for them. So if you could, would you consider taking additional courses that focus entirely on queer and trans topics? If I could, and it fit into my general education requirements, I, I would love to do that. If not here, and I would offer that option at UC Davis, I definitely would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you worried about how much you have to pay for your units right now? And so if it doesn't fit into your plan, your educational plan, it might be unaffordable. Yeah. Uh, so since I'm out of state, I pay instead of the 46 per unit, it's 395 per unit. And so every semester it averages out about 4000 to 5000 um, At one point, I owed the school like $17,000 because it piled out the summer semester, the summer units and then the um, fall units. I paid enough where it's now only 4000 but it's still a lot of money and my FAFSA doesn't, they don't disperse it again, the funds until late fall, which kind of sucks, but whatever. But so yeah, I'm worried about that because I feel like they're just asking for money for things I'm not even paying for. That's why I had to, like the classes I'm taking out for summer are not the ones I wanted to take. I got dropped out of my last summer classes that I enrolled in earlier in the semester, like last semester, because I didn't pay my funds. And I couldn't because I was trying to make sure I dispersed it, like I had enough to like disperse it in uh, like little payments. And then they completely kicked me out because I said I couldn't pay my funds, so unless I pay them, I couldn't enroll. And so I enrolled in these late classes because they were the only ones available. That's why I have to commute almost two hours by bus to the Thomas to take my Psych 300 class. So ARC kind of sucks for that, but at least I'm going to school. Um, so have you had any issues in the classroom feeling like uh, experiencing discrimination or harassment? I haven't had any yet. I have been misgendered a few times, but it's not their fault. I think they just forget sometimes. And I keep reminding them, but sometimes it just doesn't click. I don't know why. I think people just forget. Um, no, I mean, I get little like whispers when I say, hey, I'm trans. I use he, him pronouns. I'm like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And I think it's just because they're curious. I don't think it's any anything with ill intent. I think it's just like, oh, okay, that's cool. There may be somewhere they make fun of it. It's like, oh, another queer liberal. Uh, you know, crying, there are snowflakes here, some crap like that. It's always that reaction. I bring, I bring out that out in people, but at this point, it's like, I don't really care. I'm happy. I'm in a good relationship. I'm going to school. I have a job. I have money in my savings account. I'm pretty happy and proud about that. Like, my family's proud of who I'm becoming as a person. And I may not be 100%, like, amazing, but at least I'm doing well. So I don't really try to let that get in my head. So I haven't faced a lot of, I haven't faced any discrimination, just the occasional, like, nobody really understands the whole pronoun thing, or they just don't bother. Um, are you talking about other students, faculty, or both? Um, both. The faculty, it's more like, I don't want to play age into it, but I think it's just also because they have busy schedules. So it's like they have a thousand students to take care of, and not take care of, but like they have to grade and they have to meet on one-on-one -on -one with students. And it's like, oh, this student's name sounds similar to this other student's name and they switch it up. Like it's, I understand. I'm very understanding about that. But it doesn't take very long to understand that I also have certain pronouns that you need to use and, you know, not mess up. It's not very hard. I, under, I also understand because I don't sound masculine. I don't sound like a man. It's like, doesn't mean I'm less of, of that. So it throws people off when I say like, yeah, I'm trans. I identify as a guy and I use he pronouns. But like, you don't look or sound like one. It's like, what does that mean? Do I need to grow a fake beard and wear baggy pants and like, God knows what else, like stupid ass clothes that guys wear nowadays. No offense to them. Just... Taste of clothes is not very good. Thank God my boyfriend dresses well, but I don't know. 
and it's faculty is mostly because they forget they have so much going on and students it's mostly because um, they either haven't experienced it or if they have it takes them a little getting used to or um, they just don't respect it but it's like one percent of the time that happens so I try not to pay any money it's like you're gonna keep hating on me for no apparent reason um, I'm just going to live my life because I really don't care have you had the experience of professors asking students to share their pronouns with each other in the class? Oh, I have. And that's the, when that happens, I actually quite enjoy that. Because I could just say that and not feel ashamed for having said it. Because I get nervous when I have to say my pronouns because then I'm putting myself at risk for potentially being discriminated. And, I, you know, I fear being hate crime and putting myself in a dangerous situation because who would it be? But when they open that door, it creates... A safer environment for me at least that's how I feel um, when they say you know like share your preferred name rather than just share your name like share your preferred name your preferred pronouns and then they say like give me a list of hobbies you like to do and then your major so I think it's uh, the best that you can do to create inclusion in a classroom um, how many professors have done that geez uh, would you say like it's a minority of the classrooms that have done that? no I uh, or majority it's like 50 50 kind of like there's some that do it and there's some that don't um i think the ones who do it it's not a whole like view thing a political view thing it's just like they don't want to put a student in a situation where they could be in a dangerous situation uh, which i understand like you don't want to put them at risk but you also don't want to make them feel excluded it's it's a gamble so i, I get why they wouldn't do it but it's not like i'm gonna get but heard about it. It's like, okay, I'm still going to say my pronoun. I don't care. So what does it feel like to be misgendered? It feels like they were not listening and that they're purposely going out of their way to not learn. If it happens a few times when we first interact, it's because they might have forgotten. If it happens maybe once after I met them and they get to know me, it's because they forgot or, you know, they're talking to other people. It happens. Like, they sometimes misgender cis people because, like, they're thinking of somebody else. I do that. And I, you know, I take responsibility for my actions. But sometimes when I get misgendered, I, I just, I feel hurt by it. I feel, I, this is the, react, the exact reaction I make. I go, oh, that's fun. Um, but I try not to... I do correct them like privately because I understand being corrected in public is kind of shameful because you messed up and people will judge you a certain way. So I just pull them aside and say, hey, by the way, I use he, him pronouns. I don't use those pronouns. I just want to let you know. They're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll make sure to use them again. And I just try to remind them it's, it's hard because sometimes I'm somebody's first trans person experience and they're like, they don't know how to navigate. So it's patience. Uh -huh. And understanding that not everybody's going to get it 100% of the time. So how do you think uh, faculty, staff, and students can learn to use the correct pronouns? I think by, like, let's say if I was a professor and there was a student who used uh, they, them pronouns, and it might be hard for me to remember because I have awful memory, of course. The best way I would do it would be, like, if they do participate, I say, you know, uh, let's say Michael uses they and them pronouns like Michael, their idea was very good because the, it included this and this and this, and this is why you should follow their response when responding to this discussion, something like that. Or I would write it next to their name and make sure. Or the best thing you can do is like those little name placard things that they make us do in class and just say like, put your pronouns. And if you're learning students' names, also learn their pronouns at the same time because it's it's the best way you can do it. Or just say it a thousand times in your head like there's so many easy ways to fix a problem like that it's just sometimes a small percentage of the time some people may not want to put the effort because god knows why or just put the effort in yeah just put the effort it's not hard if i can remember to go to the kitchen from my bedroom and keep telling myself a thousand times in my head get a glass of milk and some cookies get a glass of milk get some cookies i can do that so can you um. Hmm. 
So is there anything else you think faculty can do to make queer and trans students in particular feel in particular feel um, respected in the classroom? Aside from actually like learning their pronouns and their preferred name and make sure, making sure you address them as such, there's not really much. Of course, my answer is going to vary depending on who you ask um, because they may have had different experiences. But for me personally, I honestly just the names and the pronouns or establishing first like there and then that you're not going to like, <laughs> you're not going to uh, tolerate discrimination in the classroom then if something happens, you know, tell the student that it's okay to tell that it will be anonymous. I think that's just like a system in place where like, if there's any sort of, I don't want to say bullying, but like discrimination happens in the classroom, that they can anonymously like tell you, like even if it's like a little box with like a note card, like, hey, this person called me a slur and I need you to address that. Just don't name me. And then just put it in there. Or if you want to be named and do like a one-on-one -on -one conference with them, the person who discriminated against them and the professor and just say, we can't tolerate this. If it happens again, we may have to intervene with outside help. You know, simple things like that. It's very cookie cutter stuff. It's not hard. Um, so, um, if another student misgendered you in whole, the whole class conversation, um, would you like the professor to correct that student? I would. I would because I can't see myself doing that because I have as much as I'm outgoing now, I'm still slightly anxious about saying like, hey, actually, no, that's not right. I have had professors in the past who, and teachers in high school who, um, when I was misgendered in a conversation, in a class discussion, they'd be like, he actually has a good response to that. I do agree that Nicholas' response is blah, 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 blah. Um, so I feel like that's the best way you can help also, like, students, uh, it's not you know, not just sitting there and being complacent and be like, oh, whatever. Like, it's a huge deal for somebody to be misgendered, especially a trans student or any queer student who's misgendered. It's, it's not okay. So, have you ever struggled academically while at uh, ARC? So, oh no. I'm actually like, okay, that's the thing. Whenever anything goes wrong in my life, my academics have always been something I could fall back on. Like, I could literally be struggling, like my house could catch on fire, there was a death in the family, I could be mentally, emotionally unwell. My academics are fine. I'm actually doing great. And I think that's the only constant in my life was my education, which is why I continue to pursue education because I have that to fall back on if I need it. And I feel proud when, even when things are going really bad in my life, it's like, I got a good score on this test. I'm doing so well. Yeah, I know everyone's different and I want to brag about it and seem like an asshole about it because I know some people don't thrive in the same circumstances as I do. And honestly, that's fine. They should not beat themselves up for that because everyone's different. But I feel like I have never struggled in it. Maybe like one class I did feel like algebra the junior year. Um, that's not my fault though. My depression got the better of me. But I do feel like I've been pretty consistent since then with my academics, so no. Um, so what do you think motivates you to learn in the classroom? Like, is there anything about how a class is structured or how a professor uh, conducts their class that motivates you to learn that you can think of? I don't know. I have had a, I have had a few classes that I'm like, I don't want to be here. Like... <sighs> Let's pray to God she does not see this. My comparative politics class, I did not like it. There were some days where I did not want to stand there. Her teaching was um, not good. And she was kind of all over the place sometimes. And I couldn't follow along. And sometimes it was it was things I already knew because I already took on the other poli sci class. And I'm a poli sci major. I do this shit in my free time. Um, so I didn't care. But she did make up for it for by like including really creative projects in the in the class. Like for our final, we did like a poster board and a research paper on a problem solution thing. So like we find a problem in a country, and then we create a solution for it. So I did Peru, and I did really well on it. I actually got an A on it, and I like spent all night trying to make like this perfect little like board to present to the class. Like it was, I put too much effort into it. 
But I feel like when they create opportunities for different types of learning, like that's when I actually want to learn. Because if I can include like artsy stuff into my education and like if I get a project then I can do whatever I want to the poster, I can learn from that. Or if I can like have the opportunity to like learn a different way. Like I like to write hand written notes instead of like typing uh, because I can actually memorize it. So to take the time to like slow down when people are handwriting notes and it gives me time to process it and I'm like, okay, I'm caught up and you can, you know, move on. So I think when I understand the different learning styles, I actually feel motivated to learn. <clears throat> so how do you find um, community? Or do you find community on campus or off campus? And if you do, how do you find community? I know you haven't been here that long. Yeah, I mean, I have had, I have had found, I guess, no, this is not right. I found a few communities um, at ARC. I just haven't joined them because I've been so busy and sometimes I distance myself from people because I have so much going on and I'm scared that I'm going to fumble having friends. But I have found various different outlets for a sense of community for whether it be because I'm brown or because I'm queer or whatever. Um, there's a lot of them. Um, but you kind of have to like dig deep in classrooms if you want to find somebody who's like you and shares a similar experience and like not ask like you're like, hey, are you queer? Or like do you, do you, some, you, know, do you deal with this? Whatever. It's like you talk, you get to know them and it gets brought up because you create that safe space to just share um, those experiences with each other. Like I made a friend, she was actually my tutor for my English 300 301 classes. And we bonded over our shared experience uh, being, you know, Latin students, being POC students, and also being in the queer community. Um, like, I don't know, I found her and it's, she and I clicked like that. And I, it's one friend, it's one person, but from that I was able to at least make one friend since I've been here the past almost one year, I've been here. One year will be in August, that's fun. Um, and yeah, there's so many outlets, I just feel like sometimes it's a little overwhelming for me and I'm scared that I might be ostracized if I join a certain community and i it's not anything they did, it's just like, I guess how I grew up, it's still affecting my mentality and it's like, you do something wrong and they'll kick you out or whatever, or they won't like you because you don't share a similar experience or you don't share a similar idea. I don't know how to explain it, but I think that's it. So what? What do you think would make you be ostracized? Like, what's that fear about? I don't know. I feel like nowadays, not bashing them at all. I'm not saying that, oh, this liberal community or anything. I don't want to sound like that at all. But a lot of, you're going to find a lot of differing opinions in the queer community. Not everybody's going to agree with you. And that's the thing I worry about. That's with any community, really. But that's the thing I worry about when joining certain, like, the clubs or associations that deal with like pride and you know queer students because I may join them and I, they might share certain things but there might be something we may not agree about and it'll be unacceptable and I might get in trouble for voicing my opinion for it or I may not agree with it but I'm not going to bash them for it and they're going to be like my way is the only right way and it's like not everybody agrees with you on that opinion you know I don't want to name certain opinions but that's that's what I fear about. Also, just because I have a lot of anxiety with making friends. And I have had bad experiences with making friends. So I'm just scared that if I straight up share who I am as a person, I'm like trauma dumping on them. <laughs> and I'm like talking about so much. I'm like, whoa, calm down. You can join. Just don't spill all this on me on one day. So I think it's just a mix of anxiety. Just a mix of like I might not find certain like-minded people. Or I may trigger something in people. I don't know. It's like a lot of things. Do you ever worry that you can't be your whole self in these separate communities, like in yeah. the queer community and the Latino community? Yeah. Because if I'm if I'm hanging out with a bunch of like, you know, people like me, like Hispanics or Latinos, I might not be fully accepted by some people because of trans. But if I go to some to a queer community, like a queer hangout, sure. Um, it might be majority white because that's unfortunately the case. Um, and so I might be one of only three brown people of a group of 16. And so we'll all just congregate together and just stick together. And then they'll see us as like 
separate and they think, oh, we don't like them because they're white. That's also a whole thing. Like, they think that they're, you, okay, I'm just going to be honest. Like, you can be racist towards white people as a brown person. You can. But it's not like we're potentially segregating ourselves because we don't like you as a white person. It's because sometimes there's some slight racism in that community. Like, any community, there is some sort of discrimination, unfortunately. Like, if I go into a club with a bunch of people like me who are brown, they may not accept me because I'm trans. And I'm at fear of being a cop. Unfortunately, that's where I come from. But it's the same thing with queer you know you know people it's mostly white and I don't see people who look like me and it's disappointing and then I'm like I might not be accepted because I may be queer but I have a completely different experience on top of also being a brown queer person um hmm. so what's your experience been on college on college on the college campus in general like, have you had any issues, like, accessing bathrooms, that sort of thing? Oh, yeah. Literally, before I came here, before I had to go from ARC to here, I had to use the women's bathroom. Because there's one gender neutral bathroom in the entire campus. I don't know why. Because I was used to having, back in my old high school, they were progressive enough, at least, to um, have one gender neutral bathroom in each building. But here, but at ARC, sorry, um, they have one general show bathroom in the entire building and I'll be at like Davies Hall, right? And I have to sprint in the 10 minutes to let me out for my next class to the general show bathroom and then go to my next class. But that takes too long and I don't want to walk and sometimes I can't walk because I'm about to explode, um, to say the least. So I have to use the closest women's bathroom because I can't use the men's bathroom because I don't want to be sought out. I don't want to be persecuted for doing that. I don't feel comfortable. Unfortunately, the way I sound and the way I, I seem physically. So it's, I try to go when there's no, when I know there's nobody there and just quickly go in, go out and just run. But it's, it's not a way I want to live. It's also something I had to experience here because I was trying to find one earlier and I could not. And I had to use the women's restroom like twice here. So it's unfortunate that also from like such a progressive state, this, for such a state that it, that wants to help people like us. It's, it's these campuses don't have it. It's also not just here, but in public. But that's different. But it's so much as far as like ARC and other neighboring community colleges. I have not found that many general neutral bathrooms, and I always have to subject myself to biting the bullet and going to the women's restroom. Um. So if you could tell administrators right now why it's important for them to establish more all-gender bathrooms, what would you say? I don't want to go into the bathroom and start crying because I have to be treated as less than for something I can't control to expel bodily functions. I shouldn't have to be subjected to what I feel is mental torment because I feel unsafe going into the bathroom of my of my actual gender for what I feel I am. And I know I am. Because some guy may look at me a certain way and be like, you're not biologically a dude. And then seek me out and possibly have something they just happen. Nobody should have to feel like that. Whether it be because, you know, not even non-binary students should feel like that. It's not just me who is benefiting from this. It's people who don't align with the with the gender spectrum, people who, who don't align with that, it, it's, I don't know, it's unfortunate. But if I could tell them that, I would say that. That we shouldn't be subjecting ourselves to a situation where we at least feel safe, but we feel like we're being treated as subhuman. Then putting ourselves in a risky situation to at least feel happy that we went into the bathroom of our assigned gender. Well, not assigned gender, but our chosen gender identity, I suppose. So administrators are seem to be very hesitant to establish multi-stall all gender bathrooms. Hmm. What's your response to that? I see why. Um, it's a really iffy concept. I personally, I understand. I see why because there's going to be so many things that's going wrong. But on a college campus. Really? I mean, not like not establishing all of the multi yeah. bathrooms as all gender, but just some. Just some. If it's like if it's like maybe like let's say there's like 
three of each gender restrooms for a building. Like maybe one or two of all gender restrooms, like stall bathrooms, it's fine. Because who's really using it? The students. The students are using it. Yes, there will be incidents, incidents where some students who are not queer, not using them, will trash it to make a statement. There will be incidents. I understand the pros and cons, the worries of like something dangerous might happen, but that's with any restroom, that's with any place. The I mean, I understand why it's a hesitant choice, but we need more of those. I don't want to keep going into a single, you know, all gender restroom and having to wait 30 minutes in a line because other gender non-conforming students or other trans students, other pre students have to use it too. Because there's one in the entire goddamn campus. Nobody is going to be using it. It's honestly going to be a safer space than us going into the, to the gender restroom of our choice. Like the one that we feel belongs to us. We'd be safer because we'd make it a safe space. I know other queer students have probably felt the same way. Because we're not here bashing you you know, bashing each other for our, our gender identity. We'd rather, we want to include that safeness into our spaces because we understand how it feels to be mistreated and discriminated against. I understand the hesitation, but come on. I can't keep running to the other side of the campus anymore. So what do you think? Is there anything else you can think of um, to say in response to this question? Like, What can the campus do to make um, trans students feel like they belong and feel like they're included more. Let me see. So I said the preferred pronouns, preferred name, maybe a few more all gender restrooms and certain spaces. I feel like, I don't know, I don't know if you've known, but there's been a few emails in the two semesters I've been at ARC about like certain messages about the trans community. And I feel like rather than just sending an email saying it happened and then you know, oh, well, we're going to make sure that if you need counseling, go ahead and do this. Like, we don't need counseling. We need you to address why it happened and find who did it and either give them some sort of sensitivity training or hold like a camp, not a campus meeting, but like hold like a, a week's long event about, you know, like acceptance or something, something they would do in high school and hold more like, I guess, like queer events, like not even... Yeah, just hold more queer events. I feel like we have to wait till like Pride Month for that shit, and it's, it, we should not at all. I don't know. Like, I feel like also holding more like, like queer studies like classes as like, you know how like we have the ethnic studies thing like as a requirement. We should do that for like queer studies. I feel like not just for queer studies but for other topics and communities. But I feel like that should be included. Like, there should be a required class about, you know, different communities and their history. And you can take different kinds if you want to take, you know, about like transgender history or just like lesbian history or something like that. It does not matter. But I feel like something like that, like holding more classes where students can actually like understand the history behind us and create more acceptance and actually holding like events for us and I don't know, creating more safe spaces. There's not enough for that. There's not enough of them at ARC. Um, I guess my last question is, I could ask more questions, but it's kind of late, I realize. So anything else you'd like to add or questions you'd like to return to? Huh. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah.